Uh, thanks for the introduction and also thanks for the invitation. It's great to speak here and also thanks to Professor um, Xi to give this beautiful talk and already give some detailed introduction to the rules theorem. And I want to talk a bit more about the rules theorem, but more from the stability point of view. So the main question is, what if not the assumptions of the rules theorem are satisfied, but what if they're only almost satisfied? What can we say about the geometry of the underlying manifold? And all of that, what I'm going to uh, talk about is all joined with your jump from UCL1. Right, so I'm going to start with like stability results from like a bit more general perspective before specializing to the rules theorem. Then I'm going to present um, several results and then I'm going to, to talk about proof of the theorems. Um, so in general, of scale of curvature geometry. Um, so on the one hand side, you can ask what what happens if you impose some bound and scale curvature? What follows for the geometry or the topology of the manifold? And that's already been mentioned in the previous talk that I think upper bound and scale curvature are not very interesting because you can always find a metric of negative scale curvature. But if you impose lower bound and scale curvature, there are plenty of beautiful results like the Dirac conjecture, the positive mass theorem in various forms, like in a pretty flat or the hyperbolic setting, the rules theorem, the Penrose inequality or like more quantitative statements like distance estimates like a toric band inequality and everything i'm going to talk to about um i'm going to assume that everything is going to be nice smooth and rentable okay and so so basically for scale coverage results we can group them roughly into three different categories um, so I'm going to do this at uh, three classical examples. So I'm going to look at the uh, um, zero scale curvature case, which would be like the positive mass theorem. Then for negative scale curvature, you have the hyperbolic positive mass theorem. Positive scale curvature, you have the Rolle's theorem. But this decomposition I'm going to show you, you can do with any other scale, scale curvature result of your choice as well. So the first of these three types is what I'm calling the inequality. So for the positive mass theorem, it would be simply that if you have some smooth, complete, asymptotically flat manifold with non-negative scale curvature, then you also have non-negative mass. Um, for instance, for the hyperbolic positive mass theorem, it would be similar. Now, if you have some asymptotically hyperbolic uh, manifold with scale curvature bounded below by minus n times n minus 1, then this corresponding hyperbolic mass would be non-negative. And for the rules theorem, we have that with the standard curvature is not bounded by plus in times n minus one. And you have that g is less or equal than the round metric. And you know that g must be less or equal than the round metric somewhere. So basically you assume this bond scale curvature and then you get several signs of inequalities. And for some of these results, it's fully known, but for instance, say for the, if you look at hyperbolic PMP in all dimensions, for instance, it's like uh, there's still many open questions as well. So some of the things I write down there should be more considered as a conjecture. Um, but now having these inequalities, you can also wonder what happens if you not just have M bigger than zero or G strictly, um, or G strictly less than G as N for the rules theorem. What happens if you actually have quality in this additional statement and then you get corresponding rigidity statements so for these three results it would be the following so for the positive mass theorem if you assume that you have non-negative scalar curvature on this asymptotically flat manifold and you have zero mass that then in fact you must already be in Euclidean space with the flat metric and similarly for the hyperbolic positive mass theorem if you have zero mass you must already be equal to that hyperbolic metric. And for the rules theorem, that's also how it's more classically stated, is that if you have non-negative scale curvature and that G is greater equal than the round metric on two forms, then G must already be the round metric. So it's kind of like a stronger result than just inequality itself to also have this rigidity statement. But then there's also a third way where we can phrase this results. And this is what has received in the last five to 10 years a lot of attention. 
that's what is called stability. And basically that works the following. So we have now the rigidity statement. So if all these things are satisfied with equality, then you are on the special cases like the Euclidean space, hyperbolic space, the round sphere, etc. cetera. Um, but now what if you assume that all of these conditions are, all, are nearly satisfied? I'm going to explain in a moment what I mean with nearly. And then that the conclusion, so in this case here, this is over here, should then almost be satisfied, whatever almost means. And then similarly for the two other statements, so for the hyperbolic positive mass here, what if the, con the assumption of the rigidity statement are almost sat are nearly satisfied? What can you then say? Are you in some sense close to hyperbolic space, or can you actually be quite far away? Or what can you still say about the um, underlying geometry or topology? And then the same for the rules theorem, which is what I'm going to focus on today. So what if the, if you almost have this lower scale curvature bound and you're almost um, that the matrix almost pointed pointwise, what follows for the underlying manifold? All right, so what does nearly and almost in this previous slide mean? So on the one hand side, it's quite easy how to phrase um, what nearly means. For instance, um, you could say that the mass is not equal to zero, but you just want it to be um, greater or equal than some small constant. Or you could say the scale curvature is not negative, but um, greater or equal to some small constant. And instead of having those pointwise conditions, you could also have some integral or LP conditions. And that's also similar how this spherical stability problem of Misha Gromov is raised, um, where he states to describe the geometry of a closed orientable many manifold um, such that the infimum of the scalar curvature goes to n times n minus one. And then this so called area radius of, of these manifolds is going to one. And here, basically, this definition of this area radius is basically exactly. Um, what happens here for the matrix, but in the end, what you can always do, you can always rescale appropriately that you only need to assume one of those conditions to be nearly satisfied. Okay, so far so good. So we know what we mean with these conditions, these assumptions to be nearly satisfied, but what are the conclusions? And that's actually quite a bit more complicated because um, scalar curvature is a relatively weak assumption and it allows for a lot of flexibility what the manifold can to the manifold. And here, let me give you a couple of examples. Say here, for instance, for the positive mass theorem, um, you could have like a sequence that maybe you have here some spline and maybe here some black hole. Maybe also add some topology. And then think about having like the sequence of such manifolds um, such that um, these splines get more and more narrow. And the same that the black holes get more smaller and smaller. And and et cetera. And, and then you see in this case that even for you can construct this example such that the mass is going to zero. Um, however, the geometry of the manifold and even the topology as well are still far away from Euclidean space because even because in these um, very small because these very small splines or these very small black hole, holes in, in topology they don't contribute a lot to mass. So if you want to understand the stability question to say you're almost close at Euclidean space, um, you have to precisely understand how to deal with um, these examples. And the same also in all these examples can be constructed for all these other appearances as well. So you can also, so for a rule, you have exactly the same problem as here. So say you have here like a sphere and then think of having a lot of splines and maybe only splines, you have even more splines and can get like arbitrarily complicated. Quickly. 
And basically, um, there have been two main strategies around. Um, the, f the first one has been introduced by um, Christina Samani and Stefan Wenger, based and, Mich and also Mr. Gromov, based on um, intrinsic flat convergence and the corresponding compactness theorem. And basically, the idea is the following. Um, say we have, again, such a sequence over here. Now let me draw it for all the rules theorem. And say you have here these um, lines over here. And, and then maybe they get thinner and thinner. Maybe you'll get a few more. Um, that these splines, while they make something like like a stronger notion of convergence, like one of Hausdorff convergence or C0 or say even C2 convergence, make it impossible to expect. But um, by using a weaker notion of convergence, in this case would be interesting flat convergence, this actually will still converge to around here. So basically, the idea is to use a slightly weaker notion of convergence, which is precisely there to handle these um, splines so you don't have to worry about them. Um, and then if you say, um, I've previously also drawn these reading with topology, and these ones you would have to chop off separately um, for this process. On the other hand side, um, there's also this um, method which has been suggested by Fisken and Ilman and, and then carried out by um, was the master and by Song and Song is this idea to remove the bad regions. So say if you have a manifold like this with like say a spline and a black hole, then instead of trying to um, so convergence of the entire manifold of the entire manifold, what they were doing is they were finding um, some region in this case, the one I've colored here in red over there, that is like the bad region, and then to remove the bad region while showing that actually it's not too large. So in this case, they were showing that here the boundary, let's call it sigma, has small area, and then to show that the remainder of the manifold satisfies some better convergence. This depends on the of force of convergence. So basically, we have these two different strategies. Either um, we directly control the, um, these um, splines and these bad things from happening, or we try to, um, to remove them and cut them away. Um, also, let me mention a couple of um, previous stability results and uh, maths um, have been used to prove them. So on the one hand side, there are several results um, for graphical manifolds or, or spherical symmetry. They have like some additional structure which helps to obtain um, intrinsic flat convergence. On the other hand side, which has been recently implied, is this level set method where you can find um, harmonic or some, some other functions um, to get some integral formulas for them and then try to use them to conclude intrinsic flat convergence or the convergence outside a small bad set, which has been done by various authors. And um, I've only mentioned like a few results, so please excuse me in case I haven't referenced all of them. All right, but now let's move on to the rules theorem and see what kind of stability we can get in this case. So let me recall the theorem itself, which already has been stated um, by Professor Xi earlier. Um, so the same is the following. So assume you have a manifold and a non-zero degree spin map from this manifold M onto the round sphere, which is area non-increasing, um, or think of it just being a one Lipschitz map. Would in particular satisfy this assumption. Then suppose that the scalar curvature is bounded by the scalar curvature of the sphere, then you can already conclude that F is an isometry. And like the name suggests, this has originally been proved by um, a cellular rule using spinners, um, but there have also been quite a few other results. So it's been via spinners, it has been extended to more general settings, 
and to very interesting lower regularity settings um, by better Semelman listing their Brandler, Hanke, Hang, Senior, Hanke, and Schick. Um, and then there's also the mu bubble proof, which um, been mentioned in the previous talk by Hu Liu and Qi. And then you can also use based on harmonic function dimension three, which is joined with Dmitry Kazaros, Marcus Curry, and Yue Zhang. And now the question is, if you only satisfy the conditions, if you don't satisfy the condition of the rules theorem exactly, what can you still conclude? And that's our first theorem, basically similar to what we mentioned with these two strategies I mentioned before, you also have for both these strategies a corresponding result. So first I'm going to start with the result for intrinsic convergence. And the statement is the following. So assume you have a sequence of metrics GI on the sphere, um, such that the scalar curvature satisfies um, the following bound. So it's great equal to n times n minus one minus one over i. So basically you almost satisfy the scalar curvature bound of the rule. Then we make an additional assumption on the Poincaré constant being bounded from above. Um, then you also need the control on the air, on, on the metric itself. So GI is supposed to be greater equal than the round metric. And we also need the diameters to be uniformly bound from above. And then we can conclude that uh, many falls as in GI converge in intrinsic flat sense um, to the round metric. And there's also a related result which has appeared earlier this year um, by Brian Allen, Edward Bryan, and Dimitri Kazaras. And they were using in dimension three space time harmonic functions um, to show that if additionally the volumes are uniformly bounded, and then if you replace um, the scalar curvature assumption we have with an L2 scalar curvature condition, and a Poincaré constant condition with a Chigo constant condition. I'm going to talk more about the dif how to differentiate between these Chigo, Poincaré, Sobolev constants, etc., in a moment, and also give you um, some examples. Um, and they were basically also proving intrinsic flight stability under these kind of conditions. So this is basically the first result regarding um, the first method via intrinsic flight stability where we just um, accept that we have these splines, et cetera, um, but the convergence can take care of it. Then our second result is to um, other those splines. Uh, so in fact, we have a whole thing of results. So if alpha is any constant going from n all the way to including infinity, and if you have now a sequence of manifolds and met mi gi and the family of maps fi which are all area non-increasing um, non-zero degree um, maps onto the round sphere and then assume that you have a scalar curvature bound and um, this time with just a certain lp bound um, so in fact you you still allow them to grow in a certain sense um, by this spherical by the con by this volume of the sphere. And then you need a uniform info bound on the circle of constants, which I'm going to define the next slide. And you also need to bound the volumes from above. And then you can find for every some bigger than zero um, a bad set, which is very small and such that you have not just from a host of conversions, but actually zero convergence on a good set after passing to a subsequence. Okay, so it's kind of like um, also in a similar flavor as the previous one, um, but not that the Sobolev constants, if you, for instance, plug in here alpha equal to infinity, the Sobolev constant will just be equal to the Poincaré constant and the scalar curvature bound, um, which looks a little bit complicated here, will just be the point wise scalar curvature bound, where basically you have like a whole family of results depending on how you approach the um, conditions of the rules theorem. And let me make a few comments on, on this result. Um, 
So first of all, um, if you have that these maps FI are just identities, so basically if you're just staying on the sphere the whole time, then this uniform volume bound can be blocked. That's kind of, I think, nice that this result can be stated um, also for arbitrary manifolds and for the metric to be um, bigger than the round metric, the two forms rather than one forms, which is maybe the more the spirit of the rules theorem. And then, as I just mentioned, for alpha to infinity, the first two conditions will just will just imply be implied from the first two conditions of the previous result of theorem one. And then finally, it also like it's important that we actually pass the subsequence. And it's very easy to construct sound examples otherwise. So think of the following example. Say we have here something which is very close to round sphere. And then you have some spline over there. And now what you can actually do, you can take the spline and rotate it around. And you can rotate it around in such a way um, that the spline, um, or the, that the manifold behaves badly is actually covering the entire manifold. So you can construct these examples where at no point of your manifold, you actually converge in Z0. Um, so you really have to be careful about these kind of examples and passing to a subsequence is therefore quite important. Um, maybe let me briefly stop at this moment. Are there any questions about theorem one or theorem two, or the rules theorem in general? OK, if there are no questions, um, let me move on with the talk. So as you see in these results, um, we were using this um, Zobolev constant, CS alpha. And um, then in the, in the previous result over here, we were using a Porcury constant bound. And then um, Brian, Edward, and Dimitri we are using a chief constant bound. Um, so I think it's a good idea at this point to actually define all of these different constants and briefly discuss how they relate to each other. Um, so basically, all of them are defined by extremizing um, either some functional um, inequality, qualities are some geometric relations. So you always have this equivalence that you can either define it geometrically via area and volume, or you can define it as certain directly integrals. Um, and then the Porcury constant is just the minimum of um, this L2 norm divided by the W1 2 norm of this function U, which is also just the inverse of the first eigenvalue of the Laplacian. And the geo constant is like some isoprometric constant and the Sobolev constant is basically similar, like the Poincaré constant, um, just that you have a bit more flexibility with your constants. But I think it's probably much more helpful if I just draw you some picture to exactly see how um, they relate instead of just giving you these formulas. Um, so first of all, there's the theorem, um, which is known as Giga's inequality, which says that a Poincaré constant bond implies a Giga constant bond. And there's also the reverse of the statement, which is known as Bruce's inequality. And namely, if you have a um, Ritchie curvature bond additionally, then a Giga constant bond also implies a Poincaré constant bond. Um, so this inequality over here. Yeah, didn't intend to do that. Here we go. So this one over here also follows if Richie is bound by is rich is bound from below. But if you don't have the Richie curvature bound, it's easy to construct bond examples. Okay. And let, let me give you now two different examples. So we always have these bad regions in mind, and they're like these two different types. On the one hand, you have the splines. 
On the other hand side, you have these bubbles or like or these black holes. And there are like different kinds how this bubbling can occur. So on the one hand side, um, for instance, take here a sphere. And then connect the sphere via a very thin neck to another sphere. And then what you can also do, you can, instead of taking a very, very short neck, you can make a thin but very long neck and connect it to another sphere. And that's a very nice paper by Paul Sweeney. And he showed that you can actually make this construction such that in this case, scalar curvature is greater or equal than n times n minus one minus epsilon. So having these two spheres, this, this bub or this bubbling with like very long necks is very problematic because if you want to prove something like intrinsic flat convergence, we really need to rule out these cases a priori because they would satisfy all the assumptions of the result. Um, so the scale curvature is really close to the one needed for the Wolf's theorem, but clearly they're like quite far away from um, the round sphere. So we need to roll them out. And this is precisely what is done by a Poincaré constant per bound or a, a Chiga or a Sobolev constant upper bound. So to extremize this Poincaré constant, just think of taking a function which is equal to say minus one here and plus one there, and then go slowly from minus one to plus one over here. Then it will have a large L2 norm, but a very small, the gradient will have a very small L2 norm. So the Poincaré constant will be very large. Um, but then on the other hand side, this example over here, um, which I've drawn above, this actually shouldn't be problematic. I mean, it would still um, violate the conclusion of the theorem, but if you have this very short neck, you're never able to ensure that the scalar curvature is close to the one for the sphere because the small neck um, creates a lot of negative scalar curvature. And so you sh don't need to actually rule this out. And in fact, if you compute for such examples um, the Poincaré constant, so the Poincaré constant in this example is bounded, which is very different than what happens for the um, Chigo or isoparametric constant, because for the Chigo constant, say just take a surface sigma over here, then the surface will have very small area, but on either side and it encloses a lot of volume. Um, so that's sort of like this little distinction between the Poincaré constant bound, which is like an L2 quantity, and the Chigo constant, which is more like an L1 quantity. And otherwise, all the Sobolev constants they behave much more like, they behave similar like the Poincaré constant because they're also all two quantities. And basically the, the reason why once you get something with L, with L2 control, once with L1 control, just because of the proof techniques, because for spinners, you always get these um, T squared in your integral formula, where in the integral formulas for harmonic or space harmonic functions, you have norm gradient u appearing to the power one, um, which has some, it basically has some advantages and disadvantages. Namely, you need a um, little bit more control on these geometric constants. But on the other hand side, um, which we're going to see in the proof later, it gives you like some W12 estimate for free, which then allows you to not assume that much control in scalar curvature. So it's kind of like interesting that these different techniques are like give like similar but slightly different results. It's interesting to see what else can be said. All right. Um, so that's what I wanted to say about comparing these different geometric constants. So let's have a look at the proof. And let's first have a look at the proof strategy. Um, 
So what I'm going to prove now is the following lemma. Um, and the lemma says that if you have some even integer and some metric on the sphere, and then you have a very small constant epsilon, the exact value of epsilon is not important. And suppose that G is greater or equal than the round metric on two forms, and that the scalar curvature is greater or equal than n times n minus one over epsilon times epsilon. And then the claim is that then you actually get volume convergence, namely the volume of the sphere with respect to um, the new metric minus the one with respect to the round metric. Um, yeah, that should be should be a zero here. Is bound, the difference is bounded by a constant times the square root of epsilon. So in particular, if epsilon goes to zero, you get volume convergence. So and I was stating the whole thing in terms of the epsilon, and so I don't have to deal with subscripts i all the time, which makes it hopefully a bit clearer. And why is this result relevant um, for what we want to prove? So I'm going to focus on theorem one in even dimensions. And the uh, point is this beautiful paper by Brian Allen, Michael Perales, and Christian Zamani, where they show that if you have additionally um, g greater or equal than the round metric um, for vectors instead of two forms, and a uniform diameter bound, then you in fact get intrinsic flat convergence. Okay, so basically combining this lemma with that paper immediately gets theorem one in even dimensions. And then to get odd dimensional case, um, one proceeds then exactly like in the rules original paper. Um, so I'm gonna omit this part since it's really identical to what happens, happens there. Oh, all right. Um, so how can you um, prove this uh, volume convergence? So that will proceed in four steps. And I'm actually giving you not just a proof sketch, I'll give you the entire proof of this lemma in case we have an even dimensional manifold. And the first step is to um, use the following result of LaRule, which is in his original paper. And he basically obtains the Anais integral formula. And and, the claim, and basically, if you just take the uh, basis with, with orthonormal with respect to both your new metric and the uh, front metric, um, and then if you let lambda i over here be just the length of e of these orthonormal vectors with respect to the metric G, not that the length of ej with respect to the round metric would just be one by definition, but then this lambda j this then can be like anything that because you are um if you're increasing you always know that lambda j times lambda l if they are disjoint you always know that this is going to be greater or equal than one and then what LaRue showed essentially is that the integral of some harmonic spinner phi squared and the spinner is you get it from like a twisted spinner bundle, but the details of this are not important. Um, and then if you take the spinner times the sum of all j and equal to l of one over lambda j lambda l minus the scalar curvature, then this is greater or equal than four times the integral over the sphere of the gradient of the spinner squared. And that's actually a um, really nice formula the rule has. And also note that it already implies um, the rules theorem. Also, by the way, this formula holds for even dimensions. Um, so in particular, so now if you assume that the scalar curvature is greater or equal than n times n minus one, and then you have the sum over here. Now that all of these summons, um, lambda j lambda l is greater or equal than one, so one over this is less or equal than one. And if and then if you look like exactly how many summons you have, you get that the whole sum over here. The whole sum over here is in fact um, just less or equal than n times n minus one. So if you subtract the scalar curvature, which is equal to n or greater or equal than n times n minus one, then you immediately get that the C is parallel. And from that you can then um, include that your round sphere already. 
Um, but this formula will also be useful for the stability questions. And for that, we're going to um, distinguish our manifold into a good and a bad set. So even for we're doing this intrinsic flat approach, it's still going to be helpful in this, this, this approach to um, do this decomposition into a good and a bad set. And we have the following definition. So the good set is just equal to the set of all x in Sn, where the maximum of all, all L is equal to J of lambda L times lambda J is less than one plus the square root of epsilon. And why is this a good set? Um, because you already know that this lambda L lambda J is quite equal in one by assumption. So now you also squeeze it with or say it's bound from above by one plus the square root of epsilon. So basically in the good set, um, you're already very close um, to the round to, to the round sphere, or more precisely, G is very close to GSN. And then what is the bad set? That's quite simple. That's then just SN minus the good set. So now we want to get volume convergence. So basically what we want to show is that the volume of G is going to the volume of the sphere and that the volume of the bad set is going to zero. Okay, let's start with the easiest case first. So what do we have on G? So on the one hand side, um, this is what I just mentioned, we you know from assumption that lambda L lambda J is greater or equal than one um, from assumption. And then from the definition on the good set, we also have that lambda L times lambda J is less than one plus the square root of epsilon for L not equal to J. And actually, um, even for that's, that's more relevant for theorem two, but I'd remark this anyways, this immediately implies that one minus the square root of epsilon is less equal than lambda j, less equal than one plus the square root of epsilon. And so, so basically, instead of just having control on these two forms, actually immediately get control on the one forms, um, assuming that n is greater or equal than three. And why is this the case? So that's an easy contradiction argument. So for instance, um, assume that lambda j, or say, say, we, say we take the first one, suppose that lambda one, is greater than one plus the square root of epsilon. Um, but then in order to satisfy um, satisfy the two above conditions, that means that if you multiply it with any of the other, other lambda j's, they have to be very small. So, so lambda two and lambda three can't be too big, but then if you multiply lambda two and lambda three together, then they can become too small. So, um, using these two conditions, you actually get this nice control on one forms. And so actually this means you even see zero clause. So that's, that's also the reason why we get C zero convergence rather than just gram of host of convergence in theorem two. But all that you want to get here, um, is volume convergence. And of course, if you have, um, this control over here, we also get that the size of the good set back to G is just less equal than one plus the square root of epsilon to the power n times the size of the good set with respect to the round metric. And this over here is of course less equal than the size of the entire sphere with respect to the round metric. Okay, so controlling the good set was relatively easy, but that's also precisely how we set up the good set that it, um, that their G is close to the round metric. So there you get this nice control. But now let's look at a bad set and there things are gonna be a, a bit more interesting. Um, so for that, we need to- I have a quick question. Uh, yes, Christina? Yeah, um, the good set, you don't, and there's no knowledge of the shape of it, right? <laughs> 
Uh, yes, it could be like um, anything. Yeah, so it could be disconnected and it can have all sorts of like holes all over, right? Yeah. I mean, examples. Yeah, like for instance, yeah. if you, it's probably good having like a picture there. Um, say if you have like here, this is an example. Yeah, right. You can expressly construct these lines. Then basically, the bad set is going to be all of this. And the good set is going to be the rest. And basically, the claim is that all the good set is actually converging in terms of volume to the volume of the round sphere. Mm -hmm. And that uh, these red dots, um, that they are the size of them, that the volume of them is going to zero. So it's a little bit different than. I mean, so so one of your challenges, you, you sort of are getting C0 closeness, but on the other hand, since you don't know the shape of the boundary, I mean, yeah, so we always have it's to, sort of like, you know, the 2J is to close to G like infinity. Yeah. Yeah. The regions that you're cutting out are can be very bad, like really bad boundary too, right? Now, yeah. Basically, the only thing we get is um, from like um, how the bad set behaves is mm -hmm. that it's defined via these um, lambda i's, lambda j's over there, but can be very disconnected. Um, very disconnected and, and a very unsmooth boundary, possibly. Yeah, also we don't also we don't assume like bounded geometry of the sequence of manifolds. Yeah. Um so also like say second fundamental form of the boundaries of the bad set I can also be arbitrary in that. Okay, great. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify. Yeah. Okay, great question. Thank you. Okay, so okay, so we need to do two, so we already have done the first part, so also the non-red stuff in this picture. Is, is going to be bounded by the area up to this constant, which is depending on epsilon, which so epsilon small, that's going to be very close to one. So where we get, and we know that, um, we always know that we are bounded from below. So, so we already know that the good set in terms of volume is, is converging, but now we have to show that the bad set is getting very small. And so far we actually have hardly used any of our assumptions. Um, but now they come in, and that's also necessary because, say, say if you're taking this picture, instead of one of these um, uh, fingers, what if you put in, like, for instance, here's um, something more complicated, um, like perhaps some bubble over here, and maybe you have even more splines at there. You could have theoretically a lot volume in here. So we actually still need to make use of the Poincaré constant bond because otherwise the result would be false. So how, how does this work? So let's so let's first start with this very short estimate. So if you just look in this integral formula of LaRue, there's this following term appearing. So if you have the sum of all L not equal to J of one over lambda L lambda J, minus the scalar curvature. So this is exactly the term which appears in LaRue's formula. And now if we are on the bad set and say the following. So this is so and, and let's just assume for simplicity that lambda one is less equal than lambda two, etc. all the way up to lambda n. So this is actually just less or equal than two over lambda n minus 1 times lambda n minus 2 plus epsilon. OK, so why is this the case? So we know that there, so we know that the scalar curvature is greater or equal than n times n minus 1 um, minus epsilon. So we are using this. But on the other hand side, we know that every single one of these lambda l, lambda j's, we know that all of them are greater or equal than 0 by assumption. And so we are applying this inequality that this is greater equal to one. We apply this to all of them, except for the last one where L is n and j is n minus one. And because of symmetry, we also get when L is n minus one and j is n. And now we can just apply the definition of the bad set um, to, say, to see that this is actually just less or equal than two times one plus the square root of epsilon inverse minus two plus epsilon. 
So remember the definition of the bad set. Let me quickly scroll up. They are the maximum of these lambda L lambda J's, which would be in this case just equal to lambda n minus one times lambda n. This is for the bad for the bad set, it's greater equal than one plus square root of epsilon. So we can insert this over here, we, we get this disappear, and then um then this is just, just an L metric computation. This is in fact just um less equal than minus the square root of epsilon. So actually this term appearing global formula actually has an interesting sign. But what does this tell us? Now if we just use the, the, the integral formula, we have that zero uh, is less equal than integral over the sphere of the harmonic spin of phi squared and then times this quantity. So L is equal to J, one over lambda L lambda J minus the scalar curvature back to the G volume. Now we can just divide it into the good and the bad set. And we see that this is less equal than epsilon times the integral p squared on the good set. So there we just use that, OK, this is greater equal than epsilon, less equal than epsilon everywhere. But then we get this better estimate on the bad set. So we get here minus the square root of epsilon and then the integral of the bad set of p squared. And now we're actually almost finished. Now imagine, for instance, that the norm p squared is just equal to one. But then, but then, and then you can, then you see that um, the size of b is actually controlled by the square root of epsilon times the size of g. But we already know that g is bounded. So, and then because of this epsilon factor over here, we are finished. So all that remains is to have now some additional. Um, L2 estimate, and then we are then we are finished. And that's also precisely where the Poincaré constant bound is coming in. So we have that the integral of um, p squared, p minus one squared, then by the Poincaré inequality, this is just less equal than the Poincaré constant of the integral in everything respect to the G volume of gradient norm phi squared. But then you can use Cato's inequality, and this is just less equal to integral of gradient phi squared. But then we can use the integral formula of the rule for a second time. And this is just less equal than one for epsilon times this Poincaré constant um, of integral. Squared. Okay. And now we are almost done. Now, if this term over here, if we, multi if we multiply it out, this is just equal to the integral over phi squared minus two times integral of phi uh, plus one. And then phi is normalized such that the integral is just giving you the volume of the sphere. So this is just equal to the integral of phi squared minus the size around sphere. So this immediately tells us that on the good set, the integral of phi squared is roughly less or equal up to this one fourth epsilon CP factor, the size of the, the, the size of the round sphere. Um, so, so that's perfect. So we can already control here and just estimate over here. The first term. So we know that this one is roughly like um, the size of the sphere. So now you just need to estimate the second one, but that's exactly the same. Um, so what you obtain is that if you integrate over the bad set, e squared, then by just using Cauchy Schwartz, it's the same as if you integrate over the bad set um, phi minus one squared plus one. But now this is just the same as if you have the area of the bad set 
and then minus two times e that's a two to one half of integral. I'm oh, sorry, there's, there's a type over here. It shouldn't be squared, but we're going to square it now. Which is precisely the term which we've just estimated on the second line over here. So therefore, you can also control the integral of the bad set. And that's pre basically precisely where we need to make use of this Poincaré constant bound. And then and this shows then that the bad set is converging to zero. And that then shows that we have volume convergence. And then by um, Christina Ruckels and Brian's result, that implies intrinsic flat convergence. And otherwise, theorem two is proven in a very similar spirit. So I've already shown you how to get the Z0 closeness. And then you also need an argument like here to show that the bad set is becoming very small. And that's where you need to use such an L2 estimate. And that's um, everything I wanted to say. So thanks again. Um, and looking forward to some more questions.